What's so scary about K2 or Spice is that it's legal here. It's essentially potpourri, but laced with chemicals. It's very addictive, and the side effects can be devastating. K2 and Spice is a legal substance that can be bought over the counter. Your kids can smoke it. They're going to end up in the hospital. Besides violent mood swings, this stuff can turn someone brain dead after only a few uses. And social workers and law enforcement are at a loss on how to get rid of it. Officers searched five stores near Broadway and Myrtle Avenue looking for the drug, also known as synthetic marijuana. 30 plus people overdosing on K2 is a throwback from the era when we had crack dens spread throughout this community. We are not going back. Welcome. I'm Ben Boyce. This is the Dr. Junkie Show. And today's episode is about spice, also known as K2 or tune, and sometimes sold as potpourri or incense. These are all terms for synthetic cannabis. They're those little packages of fake weed that started showing up behind gas station counters a few decades ago. And they've changed over the years to keep law enforcement on their heels. Most convenience stores don't sell spice anymore. But that doesn't mean you can't buy it. The internet has opened Pandora's box and made virtually any drug deliverable right to your doorstep. As we'll also see during this episode, the technologies that define an era, in our case, internet tech, shipping tech, globalization tech, those technologies shape what life looks like during that era and on into the future. That's what Marshall McLuhan meant 50 years ago when he said the medium is the message. But I'll get to all that later. Like all drugs that appear to be new, synthetic cannabis made news headlines across the country when it hit the streets. People called it a zombie drug for a while because it sometimes affects people who use high doses. Completely psychotic. They look like zombies. Yes, somebody's going to shoot at me. Nobody's going to shoot you. They're um hearing voices and seeing things that aren't there. Naked and out of their minds. Doesn't look like he has clothes on at this time. You've seen the bizarre behavior. People ripping their clothes off, leading police on chases. That's because of how it works in the body. Even though it's called synthetic cannabis, it doesn't work exactly like real cannabis. John W. Huffman is the person who's usually credited with inventing spice or synthetic cannabis. But as we'll see, That's also an incorrect belief. Huffman was working at Clemson University in South Carolina, and he read about how cannabinoid receptors had just been discovered and were being studied for their role in things like sleep, appetite, and memory making. And of course, the pharmaceutical industry was interested because if they could finally find a way to activate those same receptor sites with a drug like cannabis that wasn't cannabis, well, then they could patent it and make a killing selling it to people who probably wouldn't realize or care that it was the same chemical we've all been lied to and told to fear for more than 100 years now. One of the biggest reasons cannabis has remained illegal for so long in so many places is because it's impossible to patent it and it's difficult to sell it for a big markup because it's literally a weed that will grow almost anywhere. But a pharmaceutical knockoff that would be patentable. Cha-ching. Cannabis also binds to both CB1 and CB2 receptor sites in our body, which, from a pharmaceutical perspective, isn't as preferable as having a potential drug that might be able to bind to just one and not the other site, preventing the effects of activating both. That's what Huffman was working on when he discovered his synthetic cannabinoids. He and his team spent years on this project, And by the time they finished, they'd discovered more than 300 chemicals that they believed might work to activate cannabinoid receptors in the human body. They didn't test any of them for safety or for efficacy, because they were planning on being just the first of many steps in the process of discovery and refinement. They assumed somebody would pick up where they left off and develop these chemicals for pharmaceutical use. In 1995, they published their research online. And they also published diagrams of the chemicals, recipes for clever Walter White types who knew just enough about chemistry to recreate them in home labs. Thirteen years later, in 2008, Huffman got a message from a blogger in Germany who told him that one of his chemicals, 
one called JWH-018, that's John W. Huffman, 18th Chemical Synthesized. The blogger said that this chemical had shown up in a fake marijuana on the shelves called Spice. And from there, Huffman's name blew up, because humans always look for someone to blame whenever things go wrong. But it turns out that Spice had more than just one synthetic cannabinoid in it. And at least one of the others wasn't even invented by Huffman. It was synthesized 24 years earlier by a little pharmaceutical company called Pfizer. Yeah, that Pfizer. The blogger hadn't made this connection because Pfizer had learned enough about bad PR by that point to limit their public information, whereas Huffman was actually trying to advance science and trying to share his discoveries with as many people as possible. That's what actually caused him to ultimately shoulder most of the blame for the original spice epidemic back in the 1990s. Pfizer's chemical was called CP47497, and Pfizer knew it was a cannabinoid. Unlike Huffman, Pfizer had done some research. In 1982, in a paper titled Cannabimetic Activity from CP47497, researchers claimed that CP47497 was at least three times as potent as THC, and up to 28 times as potent. They also said that it was so closely related to THC that it would probably produce many of the same effects in humans. You can check out that article in the episode description if you're curious. So here we are once again in that familiar territory called the Iron Law of Prohibition. It says that any time a substance is illegal, the cheapest and most potent form of that substance will quickly become the most common form of that substance. You can't ever rid a culture of anything that people want, but you can restrict those things. And, in the process, you can inevitably make the supply more potent, and, as such, much more dangerous. So let's take a quick time out here to explore a bit of theory. First, a reminder that I'm not a medical doctor, and this podcast does not offer medical advice. I'm a doctor of communication. And that means, with me, you get a basic description of how things work, followed by a more in-depth explanation of how those things interact with the world and with us humans. And any time I get a chance to nerd out on a theorist who I really enjoy, I take it. So today, it's Marshall McLuhan, a theorist from the mid to late 1900s whose best-known quote is probably the one I mentioned a few minutes ago, the medium is the message. I should say right away that there's a bit of a misquote there. The book was actually called The Medium is the Massage, but only because a typo that McLuhan allegedly saw on early drafts of the book he enjoyed, so he left it that way. Anyway, the medium is the message just means that how we transport information is way more important than what information we transport. It means that the medium of television did far more to shape our cultural norms than any one show ever could have. It means that technology inevitably shapes the world in ways that are hard to spot in real time, but that we often see clearly decades later. Think about how radio changed the way wars were fought, or the way goods were transported. The automobile, and later the roads built to accommodate it, they both change the way our culture thinks about things like commerce, farming, leisure, visiting family far away, or working miles from one's home. The television shaped our personal interactions as families. We went from sitting in circles facing one another to staring at a single point of distraction, and this certainly changed how we communicate. It also changed our normal practice of news consumption, from reading long articles in newspapers at our leisure to watching short summaries of stories on news shows scheduled at the same time every day. Zoom made the idea of working from home, which was unheard of in many jobs, commonplace. Automatic driving cars will eventually make DUIs a thing of the past, and fatalities from car crashes incredibly rare. Social media has helped turn much of the contemporary world into deliberately misinformed smartasses who don't feel like they have to do their homework before they get to play expert. And all of it just happened as a result of using new technology that felt like it simply improved the old ways of life. 
We didn't see most of the changes in what it means to be a human coming. The medium is the message. So what's that got to do with spice? Well, we used to live in a world where goods traveled slowly and where natural products were easier to produce than synthesized goods, where messages required days or weeks to travel distances that they can now travel instantaneously. And as all those things changed, laws and norms that once solved certain problems often stopped working or even made those problems worse. Copyright laws were much easier to enforce when text was contained to paper. Media of all sorts, from film to music to art, has now moved from bootleg DVDs purchased in gas station parking lots to online streaming services where stolen movies often show up before they even hit theaters. And chemicals that were once really difficult to manufacture keep getting easier and easier to produce and easier and easier to mess up. Methamphetamine was just the first big wave of this movement. But nowadays, it's also happening with fentanyls. We used to have to grow opium crops and harvest poppy sap for distillation into natural morphine, then on into heroin. But fentanyl doesn't require poppies, and it's much more potent than natural alternatives like heroin, morphine, or codeine. Methamphetamine doesn't require natural ingredients either, and it's also far more potent than natural stimulant alternatives like caffeine or coca, or even cocaine. In synthetic cannabinoids, you guessed it, they're also cheaper and easier to produce without the bother of bulky plants, and they're far more potent than marijuana anyway. It's a win-win for drug dealers, but it's a double loss for drug users, and it's also a double loss for the government, which not only fails to make a dime of revenue off taxing these products once they're illegal, but also winds up spending billions of dollars every year to fund a never-ending war against them, even though we all know that that war is unwinnable. The medium is the message. The war on drugs has always been a disaster, but as techniques for policing narcotics in the old world of natural, bulky chemicals manufactured far away ran smack into the new world of small batches produced next door with products available over the counter, the old ways stopped working and often started to make our cultural issues with illegal drugs worse, not better. Meanwhile, the internet made the recipes for these chemicals easier to find than ever. The Iron Law of Prohibition remains in full effect, but the new chemicals that have replaced the old are so potent that they're difficult to use safely. And it's all because the Iron Law of Prohibition incentivizes people to switch from heroin to fentanyls or from Adderall to methamphetamine, or from cannabis to spice. The technology of the war on drugs and the technologies of drug production have changed the world around us, leading to new problems that we could easily remedy if we were willing to stop waging war against people we claim to believe have a disease. Again, the medium is the message. We evolved as humans with all sorts of drugs in our environments. That means that most chemicals that we use, like alcohol, cannabis, opium gum, coca leaves, caffeine, tobacco, we have a history with them, and we've evolved alongside them. Along the way, we also crafted them to fit our needs and our desires. We replanted seeds from the most potent or the most resilient plants in the prior year's crop. And like dogs from wolves, we bent nature to our will as humans. We've had a lot of time to get used to the natural things in our environment, but the iron law of prohibition caused cocaine powder, hundreds of times more potent than coca leaves, to replace those leaves in the early 1900s because smuggling bulky leaves was too risky once the drug was illegal. So of course, around the same time in history, we saw an uptick in problems related to cocaine use, addiction, overdose, psychosis but it was really related to updates in our natural, ancient relationships with these chemicals. We swapped opium gum for morphine, then for heroin, and we had the same problems with these extra potent chemicals in the early 1900s because we hadn't spent centuries adapting to their potency, like we had with opium. 
These original updates in technology propelled the original war on drugs into the mainstream. But we're now on to the next level of super potent, easy to produce chemicals that cannot be kept out of people's hands because they can literally make them from scratch at home. We can't keep fighting the same old war in this new environment. Back to spice. One of the biggest problems with this drug is that it's really easy to make compared to other synthetic chemicals. Even Huffman once claimed that these chemicals could be synthesized by a decent undergraduate chemistry student in just three steps from products purchased legally and locally. Yikes. Spice for a long time was also legal to produce, consume, and sell, well into the 2000s for most jurisdictions. And that means a lot of people tried their hand at making it and recorded their tips in blogs or in books. And here we bump into yet another example of the medium being the message. The old laws restricting drugs were simple. Well, they were actually complicated in how they were enforced. But the chemicals outlawed were simple. Heroin? It was illegal. Cocaine? It was illegal. Cannabis? It was illegal. But as manufacturing techniques advanced, a new world opened up where all sorts of previously unknown chemicals could be designed, manufactured, and then sold legally, at least until each one of them was classified, studied, and then individually outlawed. But this posed yet another danger that wouldn't exist if we didn't have a permanent war on drugs. When you manufacture a synthetic chemical that's designed to mimic the action of something else, like spice to cannabis, or like fentanyl to heroin, you usually start by trying to mimic the shape of the original molecule, and then move on to testing the effects. Now let's say your first try appears to cause slight intoxication, but it also appears to cause anxiety, plus it appears to be super short-acting. You might tinker with that first molecule a bit more, and come up with chemical 2, which you then test and discover is better, it lasts a little bit longer, it's a little more potent, and it appears to cause a bit less anxiety. But it still wears off pretty fast, and that anxiety would be best lowered even more. So you try again, and then you try again. And at each step, you get a little bit closer, a little bit nicer, a little bit more on point for what a human is looking to experience when they take a drug. You eventually settle on what you see as the best chemical in the end, and you package it up, deliver it to gas stations, and sell it behind the counter until authorities catch on and ban it. Now I should point out that nowadays we have kind of addressed this as a culture with synthetic drug laws designed to outlaw so-called analog drugs before they actually exist, if they mimic the effects of other already outlawed drugs. But those laws are still pretty new, and they don't always work as well as we'd like, especially in the age of globalization and mail orders. But forget all that for a second, and think about how it used to work before the blanket laws. Because that's the landscape we've been navigating for a decade now. The leftover zombie videos and the fear about overdose. Your chemical, the one that you decided was the best of all, it's sold for a few months, you make a million bucks, and then, finally, the feds come pull it off the shelf and send you a cease and desist order with a copy of a brand new law outlawing your chemical. What do you do? Well, you probably take a single step back in the production process and go to the almost as good chemical that you ultimately refined one more step to create the now outlawed chemical. And then you do the whole thing over again. You make another million bucks, the Fed shut you down again, and again, you take one more step back. You keep moving further away from the best version of the drug and back into versions that might have caused psychosis or anxiety. And of course, your customers wind up paying the psychological price, and the news winds up running more and more stories about zombie drug users or deadly gas station dope. The end result of the current model of the war on drugs is that these problems continue to get worse the more we use the current technologies of laws and regulations in an attempt to fix them. It's quite a paradox but one that's easy to solve by simply ending this century-long war on drugs. That war made sure that we went from synthetic cannabinoids that were potent and sometimes dangerous 
to steadily worse synthetics as each new drug was outlawed. As both law enforcement and the news ate up the increasing regularity of stories and videos where people freaked out on spice, public support for prohibition and arrests grew. That's how the war on drugs has always worked. The government provides salacious stories to news organizations, protecting them from libel. The cops said it, after all. And the news stations love to run spectacle stories about rainbow fentanyl, gas station zombie drugs, and kids doing heroin because it keeps scared parents tuned in. So as things got steadily worse because of how we were trying to combat the issues with synthetic cannabinoids, we kept using the very system that was making things worse. And like all of the drugs I've mentioned so far today, the real irony is that synthetic cannabis never would have been that big of an attraction for most people anyway if regular cannabis was legal. Most drug users prefer the real thing to the synthetic, even if the synthetic is more potent, probably for all the reasons I mentioned earlier about selective breeding and coevolution. We've had a long time to figure out what type of weed or opium humans most enjoy. We've had no time at all to navigate these new chemicals, which, by the way, we can expect to keep coming. So what to do? Well, that's probably obvious by now. The original spice was actually marketed to look like marijuana because producers knew their audience. People who wanted to smoke weed, but either couldn't get any, or couldn't risk failing a drug test. Oh, did I mention that... Again, with the war on drugs incentivizing dangerous behavior, most synthetic cannabinoids don't show up in traditional cannabinoid urine tests? Yeah, so that means it is in many ways logical for someone who wants to smoke a little weed to instead use an unregulated, unlabeled synthetic drug that will prevent them from getting in trouble for a failed drug test, even if it's more dangerous than weed. Cannabis is a partial agonist at the cannabinoid receptor sites in our body, and there's some evidence that CBD, cannabidol, works to prevent the overactivation of these sites and to regulate anxiety that might otherwise show up with just THC. Synthetic cannabinoids, on the other hand, they're full agonist. They bind to cannabinoid receptor sites and lock in, causing much more intense effects. That's why spice is so much more potent than cannabis, and it's why people that use it often have a very different experience than someone who uses cannabis. Those original producers, when it was still being sold in gas stations and called K2, usually labeled the packages with ingredients like white and blue water lily, blue and pink lotus, dragon flower, clever names of plants that sounded safe and non-druggy. Usually none of those plants were even included in the actual product, and producers would instead buy cheap plant material of almost any sort and just spray it with synthetic cannabinoids. But the labeling in the presentation allowed authorities and shop owners to think of spice-like clove cigarettes as just another fake hipster drug, while also allowing users to feel like they were smoking weed and bucking the law. It was pretty clever marketing. Unlike cannabis, spice can be dangerous. Thousands of people have died from using it, and it isn't hard to find those alarming videos of so-called zombies I mentioned earlier who appear stuck somewhere between consciousness and unconsciousness, wandering into traffic, falling down in public places, endangering themselves and others. But there's another clue here about who uses spice and why. Because spice isn't the sort of heady, droopy, fun buzz that comes with opioids, and it's not the twitchy, full-speed-ahead buzz that comes with crack or methamphetamine. It's kind of like a K-hole where you're actually still mobile. I'm speaking from a bit of experience here, both for myself and being around others who are on it. The point is, many people don't really enjoy the loss of days on end that comes with prolonged use, or even short-term use. But some people are looking for exactly that experience. And we can better understand where to focus our harm reduction efforts by paying attention to who is most drawn to this drug. Now, if you listen to my show regularly, you've already heard me talk about spice in prisons. There's a huge market for it there. And it's pretty big in homeless populations as well. That actually makes sense. Those are two groups who have been so ignored and shit on by society at large 
that they frequently just want to zone out and let days or weeks pass them by. The only way to fix that isn't to get rid of the drugs. It's to give the people who are resorting to using those drugs in problematic ways, to lose track of themselves for days on end in this case, it's to give them alternatives, identities, education, connections, all the things that normally prevent most of us from disappearing into that same haze. It's a familiar problem. Big pharmaceutical companies are playing by a set of rules that incentivizes them to discover patentable chemicals that can bring them a profit. So they don't mind when drugs that they can't patent or sell, like weed, heroin, cocaine, or spice, become illegal because it presses consumers back towards their legal profit-producing alternatives, pharmaceuticals. That also means that for the foreseeable future, humans will continue to create and tinker with existing chemicals and, in the process, that will keep bumping into new drugs that pharmaceutical companies can then patent again, along with others that they can't or don't want to because the effects are not all that enjoyable. Consumers continue to be given every reason to pass up safer drugs like cannabis and heroin for more dangerous, more potent, and less expensive drugs like spice or fentanyls. The system doesn't need an update or an overhaul. It needs a redesign from scratch using the knowledge that we have from the last hundred years of our own failed drug policy experiments next to the rest of the world's successes as they've slowly legalized and regulated all drugs. Love yourselves and the addicted people in your life. I'm Ben Boyce. Because, you see, suddenly, if you've noticed, the mood of North America has changed very drastically. Things like the safety car couldn't have happened ten years ago. Why is that? Now, it's because people have suddenly become obsessed with consequences of things. They used to be obsessed with mere products and packages and uh, launching these things out into markets and into the public. Now they've suddenly become concerned about what happens when these things go out on the highway. What happens when this kind of program gets on the air? What happens? They want safety air, safety cigarettes, safety cars, and safety programming. This need for safety is a sudden awareness that things have effects. Now, my writing has for years been concerned with the effects of things, not their um, impact, but their consequences after impact. If you're still here, you might want more. So consider checking out my book, Dr. Junkie, One Man's Story of Addiction and Crime That Will Challenge Everything You Know About the War on Drugs. You can get it wherever you buy books. If you want to know what the world would look like if drugs were legal, or why we develop tolerance and sensitization to drugs when we take them for extended periods, or if you just want to know why I went to prison, check out the book. 